Hey everyone, uh, my name is Aman. I'm a uh, group product manager here at Arise and super excited to be jumping into a session I've been looking forward to for, for a little while and wish that there was more content out here um, you know, around this topic. So today we're gonna be talking about a new era living amongst AI. Um, we're gonna be discussing the implications of using generative AI in our daily lives. And it's funny, we, we actually, all four of us met about a month ago um, to sort of discuss, you know, what, what would we be talking about in the panel? What, what should some of our topics be? And we realized that the world would probably change so much in the next one month that we decided to just sort of toss all those questions and try to come with something, uh, you know, to try and just make it organic in, in this session. So, um, so without kind of further ado, uh, we're going to be kind of discussing how we generate, how does generative AI integrate into society? What safeguards are there to build fair, responsible, uh, effective AI and models? Um, and with us today, I'm super excited to uh, introduce some of the experts in the field. Um, so uh, actually, they'll be introducing themselves. So we'll start with our panelists. And Anna, if you want to go first with just a self-introduction. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Anna Danes, and I'm, uh, believe it or not, an AI ethicist. <laughs> so that's, that is a job, and uh, there are companies uh, using uh, us. Uh, in practice, what that means is that uh, a company that's developing AI has their processes, and what we do is we add a layer of ethics in the entire process to make sure that the development is the way that the, the company wants it to be in terms of responsible AI, in terms of uh, how is it going to be adopted by the society, uh, it evaluates possible harms and risks, etc. So that's in a nutshell what I do. Okay, amazing. Uh, uh, Olivia, would, would you mind introducing yourself to the audience? Yeah. Um, so I'm also an AI ethicist. We do exist in multitudes, actually. <laughs> uh, it's fun to have two of us together, or three of us actually all on one call, um, on one panel. I am an ethicist. Uh, specifically, I focus on using ethics as a tool for innovation. So looking at how to use ethics as this decision-making tool, either in risk mitigation or around designing for values. Uh, I really specialize more on the innovation and value design. Um, and I specialize specifically on the operations and strategic side to responsible AI. So there's a couple different layers of us within here. Uh, sometimes you'll get ethicists that focus more on the technical components. I really look at how do we operationally um, realize our values within our work? How do we make sure that the, that the teams are, there's a, a, a strong culture built around ethics and teams are properly educated to be able to carry out the decisions we're making around our tech. Um, I also wear a second hat as an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Ethical Intelligence. We are an AI ethics advisory firm, and uh, we do something called ethics as a service. Sounds wow. super important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jen. I'm Jen Riggins, JK Riggins on the socials, which keep changing of which one we're supposed to be in in tech right now. And we all know which one we're not supposed to be in, but it's still the remaining one. Uh, I am the least educated person in the room right now, even though it's online, uh, in the virtual room. I am a tech journalist or culture side of tech storyteller. I don't tech. Uh, I write about tech and I think that's important because when these things we're interacting with and we're building and we're doing are inside our bodies, our homes, our cars, our work everywhere, we all need to be able to understand it. So I think we need more tech translators, despite the fact that uh, some studies have come out this week that suggest that my job will be 90% AI in the next two years. Um, and I think everyone needs to understand it and be able to talk about tech and everything. And ironically, over lunch day, I was called by a tech bro, a fear monger. So we'll see if anyone in the audience also believes I am one later on. That's a great, uh, just, just a great note to drop to the audience. We are taking comments. <laughs> uh, please feel free to 
drop any any uh, any interesting questions that you feel would provoke thoughtful discussion uh, to the to our panelists here, <laughs> um, and, uh, and and of course we will be following up in the community Slack channel afterwards. Um, but thank you all for for those uh, introductions. I think it's going to be very clear as we get further, you know, how relevant it is for people to start thinking about, um, you know, the, the the sort of work you folks are putting out there. Um, when they're, you know, primarily a lot of our audience is looking at deploying generative AI or deploying machine learning at their own enterprises. And, and so I think that some of this, the, the discussion will be around, you know, what, what are some of the things to think about before, before running into that? Um, I, th I think it might um, make sense to just start off really quick with some definitions. Um, you know, um, uh, Olivia, you mentioned, um, you know, ethical AI, AI ethicists, like what, what is that, what does that mean um, in a uh, sort of in, in the context of uh, generative AI. Yeah, so it pretty much meets the same as an ethicist in AI in general. It's just a new technology that we're looking, well, a new model that we're looking at. There are, of course, um, different angles, different, I like to call them like little cubby holes that we're looking in, in terms of, well, where, where's the risk hidden within here? Um, as the technology rolls out, what we're able to do as ethicists is actually look and categorize at the different types of risks that are associated with this technology. So what to immediately look for um, as, say, our immediate defaults. For example, we already know that there is a bias inherent in the language models and the data that's been processed. So we know immediately to look there for one example. Um, but also as the technology rolls out further and we engage more and more with clients on basis of, well, what, what are the implications of using generative AI? We're able to understand on a larger basis uh, the opportunities and the larger risks at stake um, within generative AI. What it means actually for an AI ethicist though, uh, we're essentially, as Anna said before, um, we translate these high level abstract values into practical action. So you are coming to your ethicist and you're asking specific contextualized questions. Um, what I try and tell people is if you come to me and ask, what should I be afraid of for generative AI? You're not gonna get an answer that you like because all I can give you is very general statements of, well, you should, you should you know, worry about some privacy risks. I like don't put personal information into chat GPT. Uh, you should worry about educational risks like students cheating on exams and teachers having to figure out how to deal with that. Like you got all these general ones that I can tell you, it's not gonna help you. But if you come to me instead and you say, hi, I am trying to build um, an interactive chat bot for clinicians to be able to help diagnose patients using chat GPT in a B2B model, I can sit there and I can say, okay, here you have X, Y, and Z challenges that you're going to be up against. Here are the specific safeguards you're going to need to put in place. And also, have you looked at A, B, and C in terms of opportunity of being able to better service the, the clientele that you're trying to develop for? So I always like to stress there, come to your ethicist with a contextual question, and we can really help you out. Come to us with broad questions, and you're going to get a broad answer. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I think that that's it's a, that's a great sort of segue into um anna like you know olivia brings up this example of bringing contextual uh problems and kind of, kind of contextual applications of um ai and even generative just being a technology or an offshoot of that um what are some of the the uh sort of you know ex examples perhaps that you've seen um you know the, olivia had the clinician example what are some examples that you've seen of uh you know ethical AI sort of impacting AI applications today? Um, and, you know, how should practitioners sort of frame ethical AI when they're thinking about their own large scale systems? And, and is it something that you think of at the very early stages of product development? Is it when you're right about to launch, you know, I mean, now you, now you got to go tap on the AI at this shoulder, like what's the, uh, you know, to just get an approval? What are some of your thoughts of where this, this sits in the life cycle of development of, uh, of AI systems? Uh, from my perspective, it sits in all the stages. And in order for that to happen, what we need is a mindset change. So the, it doesn't mean that everybody in the team needs to be like super AI ethicists that know everything. No, because there's other teams like Olivia was explaining where you can outsource these kind of uh, questions. But everybody needs to be a little bit aware of uh, of the, ethic, that, the ethical dimension of their work. 
and there's been so many scandals and there and it's it's a topic that's so popular at the moment uh that a lot of team members that normally were uh more just focused on their work now are adopting uh, uh, are, are including this ethical labor layer in the work that they do so uh, it, what i am seeing is that there's a lot of teams that are asking management hey give me some training give me a person a person that i can talk to that can help me understand uh if what we're doing can have negative repercussions, you know, I don't want my team to be exposed on the media like I'm seeing other teams. Uh, I want to be protected in this way. I understand that I have a responsibility uh, in society, that I am accountable not only in the company, but also when I leave the company, when I go home about what I do and what I'm developing. So <clears throat> there's, I'm seeing an increased interest in teams uh, about these topics. And that's very nice because that helps what I was mentioning, this change of the mindset. So what it's nice is that the entire company throughout their processes are aware of this ethical dimension. Marketing is always very aware <laughs> because they want to be shown as this very ethical company, etc. But it needs to happen in all the stages, in all the departments, product people, like yourself, um, uh, the development team, the design team. If we don't have ethics by design, it's it, it, it's not going to work. So it's something that we really need to include in all the stages. And it also includes teams that might be really far off, like customer service teams. We need to know the feedback in order to incorporate what is happening back to the initial uh, equation. So it's, it's really everywhere. Uh, in the company from my perspective. Yeah, and, and there's so much excitement, I think, because people, you know, especially now are, are kind of going home using chat GPT, using tools and out like LLMs, experimenting on their own with little side projects. They want to bring that to their company. They want to deploy it quickly. Um, and with that, I think carries a fair amount of inherent risk to these companies. And then there's some things that you just can't avoid, like ne negative repercussions as well, as, aside from, you know, all the, all the positive aspects. Like, um, Jen, what are some of the things that you're seeing in, in um, you know, in, in your space of where generative AI uh, or LMs or, you know, AI that was deployed maybe unintentionally wasn't wasn't an ethical application or, or you know, just something that, that struck you most recently? You, you, I feel like you're well, so plugged into the space. I think but, yeah. part of the problem is, though, while Anna's descriptions of companies was very good, we're also seeing a lot of AI ethics teams broadly cut during tech layoffs. I don't think anything can be looked at as out of this context and as teams look to do more with less. Uh, they shouldn't have to, but they are. I think before we can really think about the consequences of generative AI, it may become a tool they are using because they have to. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't have positive benefits. Like we know in engineering, people can pick up new languages and learn it so much faster. There's a lot of applications around DevOps, uh, around uh, generative AI and being able to deploy faster. Maybe that can help on the focus of, you know, moving towards uh, this beautiful AI future we have in our heads, which I just have to quote you, Aman, when you said at the beginning, well, AI, while we live amongst AI, you didn't say AI lives amongst us. <laughs> we live amongst AI. So that's a bit <laughs> unnerving. Um, but it, there's yeah. so there is this positive side, and I hear I talk over lunch day. We were talking about um, I was talking with James Governor. I think he'll be okay with me quoting him, uh, the head of Red Monk, and he was talking about how personally he finds just utter joy in working with Mid Journey instead of using a stock photo that he's paying for, but probably the end user gets so little. He's finding creative in creating his own images for his own writing and things. So these are positive aspects, but I think. The best analogy I've seen was Leslie Miley, who was the is an ex Googler. He was the former original CTO of the Obama Foundation. Um, he's at Microsoft now, and he was one of the keynotes at QCon, which is a very executive conference. So I was so excited to have his talk. And he was talking about the potential or likely harms of generative AI on both society and 
on the environment. And he gave the best, like a very extended analogy that the U.S. interstate highway system is considered one of the most innovative, quick, rapid advances as possible. But it enabled redlining. It enabled still to this day where he lives really close to the Silicon Valley. These kids are 80 times more likely to have asthma and really bad asthma in the time they're six because of where that state highway is put. Other parts of the highway had it so buses couldn't cross certain areas so black and brown people in New York City couldn't access the highways and access jobs the same way and public transit the same way. So I think that was a great example of how it is at scale and it can be harmful and that maybe me fear-mongering and I don't care because that's my job as a journalist to ask questions and we all need to. But look what happened. Levi's a couple weeks ago had a brilliant idea to increase their, <laughs> this is still in, absurd, um, to increase their inclusion in their marketing. They were going to use AI generated models. And I do need models as in the physical person, which yes, that's a tricky word in that sense. Instead of hiring black and brown models, they're going to use what was, without their permission, the internet trained on these models. Their work are now used to make new fake models instead of giving them work. And also their images are used to train. So they're losing money in both directions. And also, since we know with TikTok, with its new filters, it's making everybody whiter. It's anglicizing the crap out of everything. So we're having racism and harm. And then with this, just like cryptocurrency, it's requiring more and more and more data centers, which cause more pollution, more harm, and are also causing things like hearing problems to people that live nearby or just ground waste water, things like that. Like there's a lot of issues. And in Western London, where I'm based, well, I'm based in Eastern London, but in West London, they can't even do new construction because they don't have enough electricity to do builds. Obviously for rich people, construction's still happening, but for affordable housing, it's not happening right now because they don't have enough electricity because the data centers are using it. So maybe I'm fear mongering. Y'all let me know audience. Um, please do ask your questions, but there's a lot we need to think about that isn't down the line. It's happening now. And we're just thinking, oh, this is a fun tool to play with. And a lot of people are having fun with it. It's also taking away jobs from artists, which is one of the most human thing we have, creativity, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's, you know, uh, when you're first getting started with, with you know these tools or or mid journey, the the immediate application feels so clear, right? Um, you know, I, uh, I I worked at Spotify before Arise, and there was so much opportunity in terms of um, things like album art, or in terms of you know uh, you know even just artists or, or songs themselves being generated by AI, and and but all of that requires training data for for models, and uh, and, and there's this inherent sort of need and and um you know sort of th there's there's some role around what the training data that goes into the model plays in the model output and i think that that also kind of ties in with with uh, uh you know jen as you were saying with some of the models and and by this i now mean the human models that levi's might be using for black and brown model for black and brown um sort of figures in their advertising that would actually be trained on the training data that uh, that they have that they might get access to, which which that might even be limited by you know how much we we see in society today, or, or what what sort of body types or um, you know sort of facial structures we see most commonly. And so there's that sort of diversity aspect. And I'm I'm kind of curious, Olivia, maybe if you have any thoughts on what role does that bias in data sets play uh, when people are getting started? You know, uh, and Anna mentioned. Uh, think about AI throughout the in, in, the ethics of AI throughout the entire life cycle of, of when you're about to deploy or think about a project the every department. But when you're just getting started, you think about this training data. What what role does does bias play in there, and how how should people think about bias in their training data? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and so 
And Aman, this is not a new problem with generative AI. This is a problem that's existed since the dawn of AI, let's say. Um, the first place that bias starts to come into any type of technical solutions is in the data set. And there is bias not only in terms of the information collected. So for example, if you are um, aggregating data that comes from a predominantly white society, then you are going to have racially biased uh, data, which leads to a, to a racially biased uh, system at the end of the day. It also can be brought in when it comes to on the layer of data labeling. So how the data is being labeled, if you have a certain population uh, or a certain uh, demographic labeling your data, then the bias that exists in that, that demographic will be brought into the data again. Um, it's important st to stress here that it is impossible to eliminate bias completely. If anyone tells you that they can completely eliminate bias, they are either lying or they don't understand what bias is. There is always bias in systems. Bias means a, a, a preference of A versus B. Um, some cases that we talk about when we want to eliminate bias, that's unwanted bias. So for example, we don't want the preference of white skin over, over dark skin. That is not a good preference to have. That should not be a preference or say male versus female. But if you have a preference of, say like um, a, a, a concrete sidewalk versus a cobblestone sidewalk, at first glance, that doesn't, that's not really a bias. I don't, I'm looking out the window and that's what caught my eye. So weird example to use there. Um, but we are trying to eliminate the unwanted bias, the bias that we see where this is unfair. This is not a fair discrimination to be making or fair uh, determining factor between these, between A and B, the two factors there. Um, so when it comes to bias in generative AI, there is, again, the same, the age old story there that whatever data is going into that system, that will reproduce the bias at mass on scale. We're already seeing examples of um, uh, gender bias in, laid in, in our language. Um, I saw a really interesting post actually just the other day that uh, had to do with a way a question was phrased, um, a, a way a question was phrased to chat GPT. And it said something along the lines of like, the professor uh, and the student disagreed or something. Um, and when the chat GPT was prompted about what was the student at fault, um, the student was automatically uh, deemed as female because the student was at fault. Um, and then on the return, the it was prompted again, what about the professor? And the professor was immediate, immediately a, a he. So that that bias of dominance that already exists between professor and student was translated into uh, gender bias as well in that terminology. This is just something that exists in our language. So there's there are certain steps for mitigation that you can do on the data level when you're looking at that labeling, where you're looking and analyzing where your data is coming from to understand what societal biases are going to be reflected in your data. Um, but there's also ways that you need to understand and be able to inform your users that there are certain biases that you will have to watch for that you have to be aware of are in existence that haven't been solved for yet. I want to ask questions. Don't and I also saw the example for ChatGPT uh, saying doctor, it really thinks doctors are males and nurses are females. It seems very clear that. Um, so garbage in, garbage out, I've learned from the data scientists. Yes. So the internet is a cesspool of misinformation and racism and everything else. So when with that level of garbage in, how can generative AI be cleaned up? Like we know ChatGPT, I'm, I, I don't feed it, but I, act, I unintentionally feed it as a published writer. Uh, it knows it seems pretty good when people ask and <laughs> send me my profile. Um, how do you train that data or clean it up? I know we've we there has been a manual intervention that is in Kenya with low paid labor uh, to remove the worst of the worst. I think from the third version of ChatGPT because it had the worst of the worst of the internet from like sexual harm and abuse to everything else, but there's still a lot of harm in there. So how can that harm and that bias be removed when it's training on such a 
broad data set that is the internet, for lack yes. of a better word. If you train a system on the internet, quotes, um, if you train a system on the internet, there's no way that you can remove that. It's just, it's too prevalent within, within um, the information that's out there. Uh, we've seen this time and time again. You had uh, Tay released on Twitter years ago and immediately within what, 30 minutes, it turned into a Nazi because of the information that exists, because of the information that could be fed into it, you just can't control on that mass of scale. We have no filtering systems in place yet that are able or that have that capacity. Um, so I would say actually the stronger generative AI solutions that I have seen that are not a solution to the example of ChatGPT where it is train, trained on internet information, but the stronger solutions I see in generative AI are actually company specific ones where they have full, complete control of the data being fed into the system, and they're able to understand and filter out the worst of the worst of the internet, they're able to understand uh, what that system is actually going to be basing uh, its responses off of. Of course, it's not going to have the same scope as ChatGPT because it doesn't have all of that training information. But then again, if you're using a generative AI system for a very narrow and targeted solution and targeted use case, do you really need it to also tell you about Nazis? No, you don't need that. So it's just more of looking at that that trade-off, but that's a great question, Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe keep up as well, Anna. Just uh, it, like maybe, what's the context for like a business leader watching this talk as well? Like how you know, if you're the I, the the sort of engineer deploying the AI system, like Olivia is saying, um, and thinking about the data set, what what would you tell like a business leader as well? And feel free to build off of Olivia's point. Yeah, I I, I was going to uh, to talk exactly about this this business perspective because. Uh, there is ways that uh, we can make a, a better AI happen. So, of course, there's regulations, and if you want, we can talk about those later. But there's two other uh, key components for me that are very important, and it's the consumers. One is the consumers, B2C as individuals. We can do things, we can ask, we can push our governments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For me, the key with generative AI is the B2B that Olivia mentioned at the beginning, because uh, this AI as a service is going to be feeding a lot of industries and at many levels. And if we can make uh, this uh, AI as a service more ethical, that's going to have a very large impact on many different sectors. So I, I, I would ask to focus a little bit uh, the attention on how companies are purchasing this uh, AI as a service. Where are they asking? So not not only okay, we all need to be to the good. No, but I'm going to start working with a company that's going to be offering me a service, an AI service. Uh, what what in in my own compliance, my internal compliance? What am I going to ask them to do? And I think that if companies started thinking or adding those questions uh, when they buy these services, uh, the, the companies that are generating these, uh, these systems would uh, improve the game a little bit. Got it. And it, uh, actually, I have a follow-up to that, Anna, because so as a, you, you're, you're kind of from the perspective of, a, of an executive or a purchaser of these software, you, you think that, that that's like one level at which these questions should be asked. Like what... What, what is the AI system doing that I'm about to buy for my organization or, or utilize? What are some other maybe techniques or ways that organizations or executives should think about AI in their own enterprise as they're building it or, or developing it? What are what are some of the things that they should maybe keep in mind? Uh, you know, when I, I love the idea of like when you purchase you, that, that this should be a framing. Um, and then we talked about the data angle. What are some other sort of self-governance things that or processes that should be put in place at companies that are looking at deploying these types of systems? Is is that a question for me? Uh, yes. yes, if you have a if, if or like media to, or uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else who wants to take it after Anna as well, but Anna, if, if you if 
you in mind? Yes, I think that um, a good thing to do is to look at what is already existing. So if I was a company that was questioned that, I would go and see what, uh, what frameworks are already in place. And there's many that are open source and very interesting. The uh, Open Data Institute has very nice frameworks. Um, there's a there's a lot of uh, ag agile games that help us go through those questions and really question what we are doing, uh, the, the the data that we are including, the models that we're using, the output that we have, and the full cycle. So I would probably go to one of these uh, tools and go through the entire process and make sure that I am asking all the questions that I need to be asking. A lot of times it's not that we don't, that we have bad faith, uh, it's just that we don't ask the, the, the right questions. So I would make sure to go to one of these tools and, uh, and, and check every little step of what we do. And, um, and I wanted to mention and maybe clarify a little bit uh, the previous intervention. Um, I see ethics not only as a layer, but it needs to be, to be starting from the very beginning. So when we start the product, that is the moment, the best moment, the most efficient moment to start with ethics is at the very, very, very beginning. Not at the end, because then we have to do it over again. It's, it's to include it at the beginning, then we know that we, we can take into account the ethics, we can take into account the innovation, and we can move forward with what we have with very clear um, scope of what is it that we want to do. Um, and I want to add off of what Anna is saying. So there are all of these great frameworks that are already in existence. Also, I would advise business leaders to look at what already exists internal. So do you have a procurement process? Do you have procurement due diligence? That's a great place actually to add in some ethical questions. You can look at these, you can look at the frameworks that Anna was mentioning and, and cross-reference. What can I add in to policies and processes that already are pre-existing in the company that my teams are used to using and going through, what's an extra question that I can add on there that all of a sudden changes the entire perspective of how do I look at this through an ethical lens? Um, another point, since we're talking about data and data management, look at your data science teams. Look at the workflow that they already go through in terms of the processing and management of that data. Again, where can you add in the ethical questions that get your teams thinking about ethics? That's one of the easiest places to start. Um, it's also what I have seen the greatest success and return on investment for companies that look at what frameworks, what workflows do we already have, and how do we complement by bringing ethics into a system that's already in existence? We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's processes already in place that we can improve. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that, uh, just my favorite agile practice is consequence scanning, which is an open source one. You can just Google it out there. Uh, but it basically asks you to ask, always concentrate on three questions. What are the intended and unintended consequences of this product or feature? What are the positive consequences? What are the consequences we want to mitigate? And always think of it at scale as it's growing. What if it scales to the size of Facebook? What are the consequences of that? So I think those are just really good questions. And yeah, I know we're talking about from a business perspective, but unless a company is banning it, their employees are already using ChatGPT and Copilot now. Whether that is proven as high quality or not, those are being used at, by everyone. So we have to know that you have to know yep. what is being used at your company as well. Yeah, yeah. I will... Um... I think the the resources you, you folks mentioned were, were super helpful. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a, in just a moment as well, just to get a little bit deeper. But I wanted to take just a really quick audience question as well here, um, and a, an interesting point that um, Michael Tompkins brought up was um, synthetic data is an is an uh, interesting option to introduce better diversity at the data level. Thoughts on this? Any any thoughts, folks, on you know, the, the role of synthetic data, AI produced data, for instance, like where would that sit in? Is that is that one way to mitigate the bias that we're seeing of in terms of these applications or any thoughts? Just full disclosure, I had a client Hazy, which is a synthetic data, but this was a couple years ago. Um, so my, ver but my version will be the layperson's version of synthetic data, but it's just different than anonymous. It's harder, it's better for privacy, it's better for protecting things. If it's trained right, it's good. When we talked about um, 
Olivia had spoken about how there's bias inherent in data, um, which is often sample size. So you could balance that sample size to, uh, it could be used to be more inclusive of people from different backgrounds and races. It could be used uh, in fraud detection because you may have only one in a thousand examples of fraud when you have a thousand, a thousand types of transactions and you can you want to balance that out by using synthetic data to create more examples of fraud and it's about reading the data. There are definitely interesting things around the entire synthetic data space as a way of balancing. And I do agree with that, that is a way. I don't know how, because it's been a couple of years since I worked it, I don't know how adopted it is already. I think y'all <laughs> and Olivia can answer better if it is something being more actively used now, synthetic data, because it is a way to balance bias. Yeah, any any thoughts, uh, Anna Olivia? Feel free to um, you know kind of build on top of that. If there's anything in, in terms of synthetic data that you've seen resonate at companies that you've worked with? I have seen synthetic data not being used as a as necessarily a bias mitigator, but definitely that privacy enabler. Um, it is a great alternative to being able to train models without. Uh, until the very last step, uh, being able to train models on what is essentially data that, that it is not connected to um, individuals. I have seen cases too of, of companies using uh, generative AI for data fabrication. Um, the important thing to remember in this when you're using synthetic data is, uh, like Jennifer was saying, it's a great point where you can expand data sets when you're missing uh, different demographics or you're missing, um, uh, you need to expand sample size. But what you need to realize when you are using synthetic data to help uh, balance bias within your data sets is you are now taking onus onto yourself of the bias that you're putting into that data set. It is no longer, it is no longer an excuse to say this is, this is just bias reflective of society. You are actually then the controlling factor of what is the bias that will be in this data set and what is not. So you have to actually have you can use it to help balance. Um, you, you can use it to help uh, mitigate certain biases, but you need to be incredibly aware of what you're doing if you are using it for those purposes. So it's yeah. a double-edged sword. <laughs> so if you are using somebody else's data set that is biased, a company is not responsible for that data set. If they're using a data set like if you're taking the onus to create synthetic data, you're responsible, but are you saying then that they're not responsible if they didn't create that data set? They're still responsible for, for creating that data set, but they are not the cause of the of the bias that is coming from that, that existing data set. So like if you used an open source data set and there's bias in that, then you are still responsible that you did not check for that bias but you are not the reason that data is biased. If you're using synthetic data, then you are the reason for that bias. And so you need to be incredibly careful there. That, that creates a lot of different uh, liabilities within mm -hmm. the data processing for you and your company. But great yeah. uh, clarifying question there, Jennifer. <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah, it's, it's almost like how many tiers of risk or, you know, does your company want to take on? Like, yeah, using something off the shelf versus building something and putting it on the shelf feel different. Even with synthetic data, I'm sure that there's that risk of bias from the data that's being produced synthetically. So, you know, it's almost like, you know, kind of propagating forward in, in this chain. Um, I, I, I've really enjoyed this discussion. This has been uh, super educational for me personally, and, I, and I'm sure for our audience too, maybe. You know, one one takeaway feeling I have is um, as we just sort of wrap up here, and maybe everyone can share their sort of last thoughts on this. And you know, as as someone who might be trying to deploy um, AI at at a company or a business leader that's being approached by an engineer that really wants to get these systems into production, what are some you know? It, it feels like a daunting topic that the ethics of AI and the responsibility to take on. But what are some ways to to get you know? It, it, I think you folks have made it really approachable. What are some resources? or you know, starting points that you would kind of leave with folks that uh, you point them towards as they look to deploy these systems in, into production. Uh, maybe Anna, you can go first and we can kind of, I'll just share maybe a, a top, top of mind resource to 
you know, when, when thinking about AI at, at the enterprise level? First, I would say have a clear idea of what uh, principles you want to have. So, of course, there's a, the regulation of your country, there's a regulation of the market where you're going to be going that needs to be very, very clear. But also inside the company, have a clear idea of, of who you are, what values are important, and how you want to protect them. And, and the key is how. Is how you're going to do that. And then you can start doing this, this transformation. Uh, but, but that's, I think, the very beginning. That's where everything starts. If you don't have that, then uh, if you can include all the tools you want, but team will forget to use them all the time. <laughs> And maybe somebody else can build on top of me. I guess I'll pick up next. Um, so one of the first resources that I can actually point you to towards. So um, the team and myself over at Ethical Intelligence, we have a quarterly publication that we specifically focus on a different either tech application, use case of AI, so forth, uh, the ethics of that, that use case or that technology. This last issue, which we published yesterday, is actually generative AI and the ethics of generative AI. Um, I'll post it into the comments here, the link just here. Uh, it's a great resource. Um, it's highly curated. We did our utmost best to try and cover the basics when it comes to engaging in ethics and generative AI, at least to give readers a good, broad perspective of where they should be asking questions. Um, the second resource I would say is engage with an ethicist. That's probably the easiest thing to do is get an AI ethics advisor. Um, engage with someone, you can test it out, try it for a meeting, try it for a month. But there are people that specialize in this space and the easiest way to start dipping your toes into meaningfully um, ethics beyond just a conversation and instead actually bringing ethics into action is to engage with someone with this skill set that can help guide you and the decisions that you're making. Um, to stress, an AI ethicist is not there to tell you that you're being a bad person or you're doing things wrong. We're there to help support you in making better decisions around your technology. So I would say that is probably one of the, I, I won't say it's better than the equation because the equation, this issue is actually a very good, very good issue. But those are two great resources to start with. Amazing. And then my first advice is very clear. Don't fire your ethics team. They're not an expendable thing. I know y'all are firing your diversity, equity, inclusion, ethics, accessibility teams, these are the patterns we're seeing. These are not expendable. Uh, if not, hire consultants to do it. That's a different budget, so you can, different budget line, so you can do it that way. Um, I think organizations really need to set policies. Uh, again, your teams are using, your marketing team is using ChatGPT. Your engineering team is using Copilot. You need to decide if they are of the quality you want them to be using them yet. Maybe you need to set standards. You want to make sure there's not copyright infringement. If that is that copyright, if it's from a bot, probably because it's really trained on someone else's work. So as an organization, you need to set standards, um, consult your ethicist that you should have on your team, um, and constantly revisit them. And then I'm going to share ThoughtWorks has created and includes a consequence scanning, but they've created a wonderful ebook. Uh, for free about responsible tech playbook with many, many exercises and practices to help organizations start their reflection. Good luck, y'all. It's a shit show out there, but it's interesting. We live in interesting times and y'all are doing really important work. Anna and Olivia, thank you. Completely agree. And I feel like that that is our, that's our, that's a wrap right there. Uh, thanks everyone for your time. I really appreciate all of it, Anna, Olivia, and Jen. It's been a pleasure. Uh, kind of moderating this conversation and hearing from you. And thanks for the resources. Um, if people have more questions, we'll be sticking around in the community Slack channel, but that's all the time we have right now. And um, thanks again, everyone. <laughs>